Go ahead, bro. Hang on, just let me say, got it, that's good. Well, it's lovely to be here this evening. Um, it's a wet and windy night over here. Um, we've had some storms and and some wet and horrible weather, but uh, we're all tucked up uh, in the dark at the moment. <laughs> You're only just starting, aren't you? We had a great meeting this morning over in Broadstone, where I am at the moment. And, um, and I want to thank you all uh, if you knew about it and you prayed. Uh, I've returned from Finland. I've had a really precious time there. Took a number of meetings with the brethren there and we had some real response and it was really, really a good time. Um, so I returned from there just recently. And um, the last time I was with you, I was thinking about a scripture in the book of Ephesians. And one of the things that Paul the Apostle says there is that uh, when he was just looking, if you like, at the saints and seeing how they were, he said, when I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and when I heard of your love for all the saints, I prayed. I prayed that God would give you a revelation of Jesus. And I've been really very exercised about that. I'm not preaching at anybody. I'm talking to you really about where I am in my own experience with the Lord. I, I need, and we all need, a, a, a pre precious and fresh revelation of the Lord Jesus. And as I'm getting older, some things are not as important as they used to be to me. And now, if you like, this is uh, something that really captures my heart, that I want to be uh, like Jesus. I want to know him. I want to see him in my experience. So I thought I'd share this evening the second part of that. Uh, last time I talked to you about faith in the Lord Jesus, and tonight I'd like to take the expression, and if you'll turn with me to uh, the uh, epistle to the Ephesians, and this is where we sort of start from. You'd be amazed. I've been in so many meetings recently in Finland, and I think it's true here in UK as well. I'll say, let's turn to this and this. And they haven't got their Bibles. Nobody's got their Bibles. They don't have Bibles in meetings these days. It seems as if it's a it's a big thing to expect people to know where to look. And when they do look, they haven't got a clue where to look. You see them thumbing backwards and forwards, backwards, can't find the Bible, the passage in the Bible. But I, I'm fairly confident that that's not going to be the case tonight. So let's look at Ephesians and chapter one. And I was thinking about verse 15. I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. There's some more that comes after that that's just as precious, but I'm going to make a, a pause there that we may know, says Paul, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I want to think about that a little bit more tonight. And when he says there, when I saw your faith, or when I heard of your faith, and I heard of your love, for all the saints. I was thinking about that whole business of the love for all the saints. My mind immediately went, as I'm sure as yours has, to the Gospel of John, where the apostle, where Jesus speaks like this. He says in John 15, I'm going to be dotting around the scriptures tonight, so forgive me if I'm, I'm a bit st stuck here. What's happened is I've got my laptop stuck right against my chest so that I can see the, the, the screen. Uh, well, not, there's nothing so I can see you. I can't see half the words, but I can see most of you. Um, but the problem is I, I can't read my Bible very well. I'm not having too much success with my vision at the moment. You can see I've got some new glasses on and they're not working terribly well. But chapter John, John's Gospel, chapter 15 and verse 12, he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. See, that's what Paul saw. He saw that the fulfillment of that command that Jesus gave the apostles and the disciples then on from them was being fulfilled. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And I'm fairly sure 
and I'm pretty sure you'll agree with me, that that's not just a sort of fuzzy feeling that I have towards the saints when I sit in a meeting. It, it has something to do with the very center of what the Lord Jesus came to do on the cross. He came to do two things. He came to, to do something about my love. That was a really important thing. He wants me to love him and also to know that I'm loved. And out of that comes my love for all the saints. So it's a kind of connection here. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And so I began to think like this. If I talk to the disciples, generally speaking, I'm not talking in a sense to you at the moment, although you can see that I will be, but if I were to talk to the disciples and ask them this question, how did Jesus love you as a as a test of how you're going to love other people? Because he said that love one another as I have loved you. Right. OK, let's ask you this question. How has Jesus loved you? You see, John, the apostle says in his uh, the first chapter of his first letter, he says that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. See, it's not a not a matter of imparting gospel facts to people is not a matter even of quoting bible verses to people the question starts off with what have you got that you've seen that you've heard that you can share with other people that's the center of the gospel it's the heart of all that jesus came to do he came so that we may know one that he loves us Two, that he shed his love abroad in our hearts for him and for all the saints. And Paul says, I saw that. I saw that in you. I saw that you loved all the saints. And as I say, I'm fairly sure that he didn't feel as he talked to them that they had this sort of fuzzy, affectionate feeling for each other. There was something very serious about what they were doing that he could see. So I thought I'd, I'd just take a few of the disciples, a few of the apostles and ask the question, to them what did you experience of the love of jesus and if you begin with say for example one of the one of the ladies that followed jesus her name was mary magdalene in luke's gospel chapter 8 we read this <clears throat> it came to pass this is in verse 1 that he went through every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of god and the 12 were with him and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Now, that's a very serious thing. Mary, how did you experience the love of Jesus? She would say, amongst probably many other things, he cast seven demons out of me. OK, that's how you experienced his love. And that's what you must do with others, because that's what he said. Love one another as I have loved you. So she would need to exercise gift and ministry in the Holy Spirit and see God do wonderful things, miraculous things in the lives of other people. We're living in a, an, an age which has been governed by the world we live in. I mean, I really think that a lot of people think that Jesus really didn't believe in demons and the devil. He just used that because of the kind of people he was with and they really didn't understand. So he sort of addressed that. But he really knew that these were people with medical needs and difficult needs in their circumstances and so on. I'm not sure that that's true. Of course, people have medical needs. People do have terrible circumstances and it affects the way they function, the way they are and so on and they need healing they need deliverance but the scriptures are very clear there is the operation of the supernatural and that's what the scripture says here mary magdalene out of whom went seven devils and that's how jesus ministered you remember the, the other pretty notable event when he went up into the mountains and he met a man who was a complete maniac 
It's called in the scriptures the Gadarene maniac. And in Mark's gospel, chapter five, we read this. They came over onto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come, this is Jesus, out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And then it goes on to say, and you know the story ever so well, it, this man was in a terrible, terrible state and he used to cut himself and he used to be bound up in chains and all sorts of things. And eventually Jesus addresses this thing uh, within him and tells it to get out. And this man says, uh, uh, sorry, Jesus says in verse eight, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what's thy name? And he answering said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them out of the country. And then, of course, the, the story goes on about the pigs and so on. And eventually Jesus speaks the word and the unclean spirits in verse 13 went out and entered into th the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea and they were choked in the sea. And the swine fled. Everybody talked about it. Everybody knew about it. And they went out to see what was going on. And when they came to Jesus to see him, who was possessed with the devil, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, they were afraid. And they said, they that saw it told them how it befell him. He was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. This man wanted to follow him around. And Jesus said in verse 19, how be it? Jesus suffered him not, but saith to him, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. That, that's the essence really of preaching the gospel. He had something to say. Jesus had loved him. Jesus had exercised power in his life and he had been delivered miraculously. It wasn't an, an uncommon event. Uh, later on, we find in Luke's gospel, um, Peter says to Jesus, come home and have something to eat. And when he gets home, he finds that his wife's mother is very sick. She's got a terrible fever. And Jesus, the scripture says, stood over her, rebuked the fever. This is in Luke's gospel, chapter eight. And it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. And then it says this. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many crying, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. I don't know what your views are on these things. I don't think we're seeing this sort of stuff in the church in these days at all. And I think we've excused ourselves and said, but it doesn't happen anymore. We're in a different world. We understand things differently. What, we understand them better than Jesus? We understand them better than the God who, who knows us more than and better than anybody else? The scripture says here that Jesus went amongst these people and he healed them. He healed them because he could. He healed them because he is the creator. And he said to his disciples, as I have loved you, you love one another. It would appear that the early church saw this uh, quite a lot. They saw the miracles of healing and deliverance and changed lives in wonderful ways. We're more concerned now about committees and groups and Bible studies and choirs and worship groups and how to keep things going and how to keep the money flowing and how to get all the organization going in the church. But Jesus, he said, as I've loved you, you love one another. Uh, and essentially, it, I'm, I'm suggesting to you this, this, this morning, you're, you're this morning, my this evening, I'm suggesting you to you today that we are needing something better, something more. Those of us who've known a work of the spirit in the last 30, 40 years know that it was characteristic at the beginning of what God did in our lives, particularly for me in London with the brethren that we knew there, that God did miracles. Demons were cast out. People were healed. 
people's lives were changed. And then it all began to sort of settle down and become rather mundane and prosaic. And we've moved into a world where we explain everything away and we change all the things that God has said to us into what we can understand and what we understand and what we feel it could be. And I think we've moved way, way away from what the centre of the church can be and should be. One of the things that I would say is characteristic of the love of Jesus is his forgiveness. He talked about it such a lot. He talked about forgiveness and he forgave people. I don't know whether you've ever noticed this, but if you take some of the examples of what Jesus did when he forgave people, what happened to them? Take, for example, um, there was a woman. It's a wonderful story. Uh, um, I don't know whether you can imagine it. I, I don't think I can because I, I don't know much about how things were in those days. But she's sitting at his feet, weeping with joy. She's weeping with worship in her heart and she's pouring ointment on his feet. And all the people around him are saying, oh, wow, what's he doing? Who does he think he is? He, doesn't he know who this woman is? Well, no, Jesus did know who this woman was. There's no evidence, not at all, that Jesus spoke to her before this event. I don't know about you, but I think that she had probably been at the back of one of the groups when he was speaking, perhaps at the back of a crowd or something, and he had looked at her. And I believe that when he looked at her and she looked at him, something happened in her heart, and she knew that she, with all her sin, with all the things that have been in her life, she was forgiven. And she meets him, she finds him, and she sits at his feet and she pours oil on his feet, she anoints him, she weeps and weeps and weeps. And Jesus, who knows what's going on, says to the man who is with her, uh, with him rather, uh, you didn't really look after me when I came here. You didn't treat me with any respect. This woman whom you've rejected, this woman whom you say is a terrible woman, she has understood who I really am. And she has worshipped me in a real way. And he said she's loved a lot and she's been forgiven a lot. And those two things go together. I don't know whether you appreciate that. Do you love the Lord Jesus in connection with his forgiveness for you? Or do you think that your forgiveness is something that you can kind of take for granted? Are you aware of how much he has forgiven us? Are you aware how much it cost him to forgive us? And when he declares to you quietly in your heart about your sin and about your shame and about the things that have gone on in the past, he whispers in your heart, you're forgiven. Joy fills our hearts. Joy that we are forgiven and connected with that, of course, and we pray it pretty well every day if we pray the prayer the Lord taught us, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Those two things go together. It's no good saying I have received the forgiveness of God if I'm not prepared to forgive those who have hurt me, who have sinned against me, who have done me damage. I, I have to know how to forgive them with joy. And this is what happens when we are forgiven he forgives us and brings joy to our lives. But the other thing that I thought when I was thinking about this man who was in bed and, and, and his friends lowered him through the roof. This is another occasion when Jesus forgave a man, the paralytic. He was completely paralyzed, lying on a bed. And Jesus says to him, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I don't know how this works. I don't know. Know what medical, spiritual, mental, emotional thing works, but I do know this that when we aren't forgiven, there can be knock on effects in our health. And it looks as if there was a connection between this man being paralyzed and his ability, his need for forgiveness. So, what Jesus does is he addresses the issue, he goes right to the heart of it and he says, you're forgiven. 
you're forgiven. And then he says, up you get, pick up your bed and go home. And the man did. He rose and went home. And the scripture says in Matthew's gospel, chapter nine, verse eight, when the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. How marvelous is that, that Jesus loved this man with forgiveness. And you'd say to him later on, how has Jesus forgive, uh, uh, loved you? And you say, oh, he forgave me. And when he forgave me, I was released from my para paralysis. He forgave me and I was healed as a result. There's another woman I often think of when I think of um, forgiveness. She's a woman who was brought to Jesus, having been, the, the Bible uses this expression, being caught in adultery. I, I don't like to sort of think about that too much, but but we can imagine what it meant. And they threw her down on the ground in front of her. And they said, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. And Moses said that we should stone such women. What did you say? They did this to test him. So he just sits there quietly scribbling away in the sand with his finger. And they continue to ask him. And the scripture says he turned to them and he said, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And then one by one, they left. They couldn't answer that. And the scripture says, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to a woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. And from now on, sin no more. I think that's wonderful. Now, you see, forgiveness was known right the way through the Old Testament, right the way through the Gospels, right the way through the cross and on. Forgiveness is, is a key to the whole preaching of the kingdom. But the thing that goes with it that's a new covenant is that not only do we have forgiveness of sins, but the power of sin is broken. And when Jesus spoke to this woman, because it was his word, he could do it. He spoke to her and he said, don't sin anymore. Because he said that to her, it gave her the ability to know the power of sin in her life broken. This is what the disciples would knew, know after the cross. They would know what it was for the fulfillment of what Jesus said, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin, not the sins, the sin of the world. The sins, yes, of course, but the sin of the world. Not just what we've done, but why we do it. And Jesus brings forgiveness into our lives so that he can break the power of sin and release us to live a new life. And that's the gospel we preach. We preach the gospel that forgiveness of sins brings healing. Forgiveness of sins brings joy. Forgiveness of sins brings deliverance, even from physical things and especially from sin. And that's what it means when Jesus says to me, as I have loved you, you love one another. When I was first uh, saved and God filled me with his spirit, I don't think I could stop talking about how much I had been forgiven. It was the thing that struck me so deeply, so strongly. I, I had been forgiven. I, who was so ashamed of my sin. I, who was so aware of how sin had been in my life. I was forgiven. And he'd done it. He'd forgiven me. And I was received by him. That's a very wonderful thing. So if you think about the question, how has Jesus loved you? One of the things you can say is he healed me. He delivered me. He freed me from demonic oppression. He freed me from sin. He freed me by forgiving me my sins. But there's more. There are other things. One of the things I did notice when it was thinking about just before I go on in John's gospel, chapter 20, verse 22, it says this. When he said this, Jesus said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive you the Holy Ghost, whose so sins you remit, 
They are remitted unto them, and whose server sins you retain, they are retained. Did you know that we have the ability to share with people a gospel that releases them from sin? We can actually say to someone, in Jesus' name, I can tell you that you have been forgiven. And we can bring that word to their heart from God himself. Because he said, if you remit their sins, if you say everything's fine, you're forgiven. That's it. It's the truth. What are the fu functions that we have on the earth is to spread the forgiveness of God amongst those who just don't seem to be able to believe it. Have you met people who do that? They say, well, I don't know. I can't believe that God loves me. And you can say to them, well, I can tell you on the authority of God, if you confess your sins and you are genuinely repentant, you can be forgiven. And that's a wonderful thing to do, to be able to speak the word of forgiveness to other men and women. Just as he's forgiven us, we're able to speak the word of forgiveness to them. Now, I was interested to notice this, and it took me quite a long while to understand it. But in Mark's Gospel, chapter six, we read this. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Now, I don't know whether you noticed that. I did gloss over the word very quickly. But the word that's in there is in the NIV. It says, so he began teaching them many things. He had great love for the multitude, it says. And as a result of that great love, he taught them. And they could say, well, how did Jesus love me? Well, he taught me. He taught me the most important things that I will ever know. He taught me discipleship. He taught me how to follow him. He taught me how to pray. He taught me. That's what the disciples could say before the cross, before Pentecost. This is how Jesus was on the earth with them. He said to them, as I've loved you, you love one another. Now, of course, in the other translations, it doesn't say so he began teaching. It says, uh, just he began teaching them but the so implies that there's a connection between his compassion for them and his action of teaching when jesus landed and saw a great large crowd he had compassion on them he loved them they were without uh, like a sh like sheep without a shepherd so he began teaching them many things one of the things that's lacking in today's church is men and women who are prepared to go to the cross, lay their lives down and learn how to bring the word of God to God's people. It's the thing that's lacking in all the churches, the word of God. And God has intended that we should love one another by teaching the word of God to men and women, not teaching Bible verses, not teaching great theolo theological concepts and isms, but bringing the word of God to men and women. Prophetic, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, teaching, pastoral care, all sorts of different ways that the word of God can be brought to people. Jesus said it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And in the church, we need to hear the word of God proceeding out of his mouth through the brethren and sisters who are prepared to open their mouths and share his word with the church. You don't expect to sit in a church and hear a voice thundering from the back. It's not God's way to do that. I remember vividly that some of us went many years ago to what was known as a Fountain Trust meeting in the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. And there was a man there who was involved with revivals worldwide, worldwide, everywhere. Oh, we were so excited to listen to him. He talked about what God had done in Indonesia and what he was doing in the, in the West, uh, in the East, rather Far East and in China and so on and so on. And he said in one one meeting, he said. I was in. He said I was preaching the gospel and suddenly I heard the sound of a mighty wind, like on the day of Pentecost, a great wind came. And he said, and, and God came. And as we're listening, we're all sitting on the edge of our seats. They turned the fans on at the back of the church and this huge sound of wind rushing came. And we thought, oh, it's not God. We didn't. We, we were so disappointed because it was just a fan. It wasn't the Holy Ghost. 
Have you ever been like that? Sat in a meeting and hope to hear the word of God and just never comes? Well, I tell you this, perhaps God is speaking to your heart that you should be a, ve a vessel. You should be a vehicle of the word of God. How can you love your brethren as Jesus has loved you? Have you been taught? Has God spoken to you in his love and taught you? Then you can teach others also. And that's what the scripture says. As I've loved you, you love one another. That's just a thought just in passing about teaching. He taught them radical discipleship. He taught them to take up their cross. No, nobody's talking like that in these days. Take up your cross with regard to relationships. Take up your cross with regard to finance. Take up your cross with regard to yourself. Everybody's talking about self, me, 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 me time. I've got to be fulfilled. I've got to find this blessing and this sort. Nobody's in the scripture interested in that. They're interested in people taking up their cross and following Jesus. That's it. A crucified life is not a life that's constantly talking about being satisfied and sorting themselves out first and foremost. Everybody's talking like that in these days. You go into churches, oh, bless me, Lord, bless me. At the end of the day, God wants you to be a blessing to others. He wants to bring his word to men and women through your lips. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the things I did notice as I was reading through the scripture was that Jesus did a huge amount of praying. And of course, as I was brought up in church where prayer and bible study were a very very important part in the brethren back in the in, in the early 60s i was brought up in a church which taught we should be praying and i found it very difficult to know how to get excited about prayer or how to engage with prayer when i looked at jesus praying i i tried to imitate him i tried to to get the words that he said and say them again and again and so on and so on but it just didn't work and then I began to ask myself, well, what was Jesus doing when he was praying? I looked in Luke's gospel, chapter nine, and there's a whole series of expressions. Jesus prayed. Jesus was praying and so on. And this scripture in Luke's nine, Luke nine says this. Now, it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him and he asked, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John Baptist. And the others said, Elijah. And the others, one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. Now, you'll notice at the beginning of that passage, it says Jesus was praying. Then he asks this question. Then he gets this response. Peter answered, the Christ of God. Now, if we take that same story in Matthew's gospel, we find a little additional something that gives us a clue as to what was going on. In verse 13 of chapter 16 of Matthew, we read, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John Baptist, Elijah, other Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon replied, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. You see, I think I might be wrong. Please feel free to correct me if you think I'm wrong. But I think that what Jesus was praying was for his disciples. I think he was praying, Father, please Please show them who I am. Show them, open their eyes to see who I really am. Then he says to the disciples, who do, who do men say that I am? And then who do you say that I am? And then Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus is so thrilled. He says, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I think that we need to learn how to pray like that. We need to pray for people to receive revelation about Jesus. That's what we're needing to do. We're needing to ask the Lord, 
oh, Lord, show them who you are. And that engages us in prayer in a very positive way. I believe that we should learn how to pray because that's how Jesus loves us. Jesus loved the disciples by praying for them. And when he prayed for them, they got revelation. Later in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, it's just an illustration, but it goes on, in fact, later in the scripture to say other things that indicate this is a much bigger story. But in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, the scripture says this in verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. See, it says here. I have prayed for you. Jesus prayed for Peter that he might have strength. And when we read as the life of Peter goes on, Peter was certainly strengthened. And Peter was certainly a strength to his brethren. And he could say when he said, when he heard the words, how has Jesus loved you? He prayed for me. He prayed for me. Well, you go and do the same. You pray for others in the same way. Go on. You pray for them that they may be strengthened. You pray for them that they may be saved. You pray for them that they may have revelation of Jesus. It gives us something to pray for. It gives us a very definite focus when we're praying for people. We're not just, Lord, please bless so and so, please bless so and so, which is very good. But then more specifically, Lord, bring them revelation. Lord, open their eyes to the truth. One of the things that happens when I travel to Finland is I go to a, a number of churches where they have a, a tradition of what's known as the prayer bench. At the front of the church, there's a sort of kneeling area with a padded stool on it. And, and people just come forward and kneel there, maybe some, a whole row of people. And it's my job afterwards to go along and pray for everybody and so on and so on. You would be amazed at the number of people who say, oh, please pray for me. My husband isn't saved. I want him to be saved. Please pray for me. A number of times the Lord has spoken to my heart about how to pray for somebody sometimes the person who's the main problem in this situation is not the husband but the wife the wife who supposedly knows the lord is hammering away at her husband and putting him off because she disapproves of him she's constantly snapping at him about his life she doesn't know how to love him because she's so agitated he's not a christian that's a, a fact that often comes up when I'm praying for different people in, say, Finland, in that sort of situation. The scriptures tells us in Hebrews, consequently, he is able, verse 25 of chapter 7, to save to the uttermost those who draw near through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I, I don't know whether you understand much about intercession. I don't. I'm learning all the time. But I heard this. Jesus said, if you drink of the water that I will give you, there will be a fountain inside you that will rise up and flow out of you. That will be a fountain that will bring eternal life out of your inner being. Later in the in the temple, he says this, drink, come and drink. He said, if you drink of the water that I give you, that's what he said in chapter four, drink this water out of your inner man shall flow rivers of living water. Now, you're called and I'm called to be a priest of God. It doesn't matter what you think whether you think you're qualified or not. God wants you to know what it is to be a priest of God. Now, I know that we on the earth have got all sorts of ideas about priests. You put collars on them, you put robes on them, you put them through Bible school or training college, and they become priests. That's not what the scripture teaches. The scripture teaches that a priest is someone who with one hand reaches out and hand, holds God's hand, and with the other hand holds another person's hand, and the process is called intercession, and you administer living water, river 
rivers of living water to men and women in prayer, in intercession, bringing God's life into the lives of men. That's what prayer and intercession is all about. It's not just vaguely talking about things in God's presence. It's bringing the life of God to men and women. And the scripture tells us that he lives, he lives, not just every now and again. He lives to make intercession for the saints. Do you know what that means? I don't know whether it's dawned on you, but he is praying for you all the time. He is able to do something you and I can't do. He prays for you all the time. Now, if you come to Psalm 139, this is a marvelous scripture. Listen to this in chapter seven, uh, 139, uh, verse 17. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Do you know what that means? It means that at this very moment, God is thinking about you. Isn't that marvellous? God is thinking about you. You might not think that you're worth thinking about. You might think you're feeling ashamed of stuff that you've been doing. You might be all kinds of things. But as far as God is concerned, he loves you to bits. And he is thinking about you and he's praying for you all the time. Just like Peter, he's praying for you to have strength. He's praying for you to get through some of the things that only you know about. Things that are very difficult. Sufferings that you're going through. He's the only one who really knows. And as I think I, I said somewhere recently, one of the things that I have regularly experienced is this, that when I go to the Lord in prayer and I say, oh, Lord, I'm struggling with this thing so much. I This thing, whatever it might be, it's hurting so much or I feel so anxious about it or whatever. Do you know what happens? I find a, a very gentle whisper in my ear. He says, I know. I know. I had a struggle for many years with people who use cliches in spiritual life. It was particularly bad about the time when Marg died because you get all these cliches that are so well meant, but they don't actually touch anything that's going on in your life. And sometimes the best thing is to say nothing at all. But I, I spent many years with people saying to me things like, you need to cast all your care upon him. And I went to the Lord, and I said, Lord, I know what the scripture says. It says I must cast all my care upon you, but I don't know how to do it. I really honestly don't know what the process is of getting me from here with all this stuff I'm caring about to the place that these folk are talking about that, that is free from care. I don't know how to get there. Cast all your care upon him, they say. But I don't know what that means to cast all my care on him until one day I was reading that scripture. And do you know what I felt? I hadn't read it properly. I didn't read what the scripture said. It says, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. And when it dawned on me that God was thinking about me, God was praying for me, that he cared for me. I found it so much easier, not easy, but easier to cast my care upon him because he cares for me. I think it's a very wonderful thing that that's how God loves us. I've been thinking a lot about this recently, but this verse in Ephesians and chapter 1 and verse 15, let me read it to you again and see if it makes any sense to you. For this reason. Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? 
that's the the essence of what I wanted to share with you. If that's all right, I think we've come to an end. What sort of time is it? Is it late? I don't know. Perhaps too long. But anyway, that's what I got in my heart to share with you. How has Jesus loved you? He loved his disciples by bringing the miracles and healing and prayer and revelation and strength and all these wonderful things that he imparted to them. And he says to them, yeah, you've been loved like this. You go and love others. I think I might be wrong, but I think that that's the sort of transforming life that will, will change the way the church lives and the church functions. Amen. Shall I pray? Please do, brother. Okay. Heavenly Father, we, we are so thrilled by all that Jesus has done for us. And how very little we really understand about the wealth of what he's done for us. And we know that as we grow older, you open our eyes more and more and more. And that's certainly my prayer. And I know it's the prayer of my brothers and sisters tonight, that you may bring us a greater understanding of the wonders of your salvation. You love us to bits. You think this is a marvelous thing that you've done for us, that you've saved us and you've forgiven us and you've broken the power of sin and you've given us the Holy Spirit who is our new life and will flow out of us like a river of living water. And you say, go, you go, you pray, pray for others, give them the water, let the water flow out of you. You give them the forgiveness that comes from God. You give them the healing and deliverance that comes from God. You go and do the, the mighty works that I've done more than I've done. And Lord, we pray that whilst those things may be for some of us a real hope that we may see new things in the church. Give us grace, Lord, tonight as we, we go our separate ways wherever we go. Give us grace to know that we're on our way and that whispering in our ear is the God who says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm interceding for you with groanings that cannot be uttered. I'm interceding for you with life and blessing so that you can go and do the same, so that you can be transformed and give away the love that I have given you. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Come and sing your hymn, Bob. Amen. God of heaven, God of love, there is none, no none like you. Fullness dwells in you alone. We bow down before the throne. O breath of God, come fill, renew the lowly heart that trusts in you. Holy, holy God of heaven, thank you for the Son you've given. He alone defeated death. Through the darkness he has risen. O breath of God, come fill, renew the lowly heart that trusts in you. God of love, whose ways are right, welcomes us into his light. Held secure by arms of love is the way, the truth, the lie. O breath of God, come fill, renew the lowly heart that trusts in you.
So we humbly bow our knee and confess that you are Lord. Yours the glory, yours the throne. Love eternal, promised home. O breath of God, come fill, renew the lowly heart that trusts in you. God of love, whose ways are right, welcomes us into his light. Held secure by arms of love is the way the truth, the lie. O breath of God, come fill, renew the lowly heart that trusts in you. So we humbly bow our knee and confess that you are Lord. Yours the glory, yours the throne. Love eternal, promised home. O breath of God, come fill, renew the lowly heart that trusts in you.